This program is brought to you in part by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. Lots of people have allowed their behavior and what they do define who they are. And you are not and should not be defined by your behavior, all right? You are defined by your faith in Jesus Christ. That's why this is so very important. And then your faith in Jesus Christ, that, that now you are righteous, determines your behavior. Identity first, out of identity becomes behavior. But what happens if you allow your behavior to determine your identity, then it just keeps that cycle of bad behavior because you've allowed behavior to, de to, to define who you are, okay? You miss the mark, that's not who you are. That's not who you are. You miss the mark, that's when you need to stand boldly on saying, I'm the righteousness of God. Get ready for change. The message of grace is coming to a city near you. Join Creflo Dollar in Los Angeles, California on January 27th and Houston, Texas on February 23rd and 24th. Seating is limited, so register now. Log on to www.creflodollarministries.org to check out the full 2023 Change Experience Tour schedule. Pick up your phone and call the number on your screen or scan the QR code right now to register. See you in your city. This is your world, so let's vow to make it a better place. Let every heart that needs to know, you love is here to stay. Ooh, it's time we live a new life. Let us love shine bright in you. We're saved by His grace, so we embrace your love today. And then the last result of guilt is, is going to be physical illness. You carry around guilt and you stay in self-righteousness and you stay in religion, you get sick. Physically, it begins to affect your physical body. And so I am saying that we cannot be uh, in guilt because dependency on, on guilt and fear, it keeps you in self-righteousness and that is not the will of God for your life. His will is for you to receive the righteousness which comes from Him. In fact, I ask myself a question, do I humble myself by what I do or do I humble myself by who I am in Christ Jesus? And I found out that I really humble myself by who I am in Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness of God. I humble myself because I'm submitting myself to who He said, I, to, to who God says that I am. I am righteous, all right? When you start believing you're righteous, you'll start doing what's right. But if you keep struggling with who you are in Christ, if you keep struggling with, I am the righteousness of God, then, you know, you're going to always struggle with your behavior. But the day you settle that you're the righteousness of God, the behavior begins to line up with your identity. But a lot of people are, you know, the other way around. You're working so hard, striving so hard to behave right, uh, so that that can define who you are. That's completely backwards. That's self-righteousness, okay? Let's look at these scriptures real quick. I think they'll, they'll really bring this stuff home. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 in the NLT. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And then Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 in the NLT. Look at this. He says, God saved you by his grace when? When you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Salvation, I love this, it's not a reward for the good things we have done. So don't ever think that, that the, the gifts that you get from God is a reward for the good things you have done. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you've done. You see now clearly what religion does? Religion has you striving and working like somehow you're going to get the reward for the good things you have done. It's not a gift for the good things you have done. He says, so none of us can boast about it. 
If you ever find yourself boasting about the gifts that came from God, you're in self-righteousness, I guarantee you. You're in self-righteousness because it is not about gifting you based on what you have done. Now, look at this in Titus 3 and 5 in NLT. This is good, too. Titus 3 and 5 in NLT. Hallelujah. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done. There it is again. He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done. I don't know if you remember, but the day when you got saved, but prior to that, you ain't did too many righteous things. You was already messy. <laughs> he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his what? His mercy. In fact, he said, he said, you deserve some bad, but I saved you. That's his mercy, you know. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit as the administrator of our lives. That's powerful scripture. Now go to Philippians chapter 3, verses, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6 in NLT. Philippians 3, 4 through 6. I just want you to see the number of times you see this in scripture and how people who are still religious, still striving to be right with God. And there are these scriptures right in here that says not to do that. And I'm thinking, wow, where were they? They were at the same place. I, I, guess, I guess through fear and guilt, we just wasn't paying attention to that. We were just trying to be right with God without knowing that he'd already made us right with him. We had to receive it by faith. Verse 4, I'm going to read verse 4 through probably 9. Though I could have confidence in my own efforts, if anyone could. Now, Paul said if, if there's anybody that could be confident in, self, in, in his self-righteousness, it would be him. He said, indeed, if others have reasons for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Now, watch this. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am pure-blooded citizen of Israel. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a real Hebrew, if ever there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees. So he was a Pharisee who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was a zealous that I had harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yeah. Now, you get what he was saying? Yeah. He thought that working to try to be right and, uh, and with God, he thought it was valuable until he saw what Christ was done. Go back to that scripture, verse 7. Before he saw what Christ was done, he thought it was valuable. He says, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. So you've got to consider religion and self-righteousness worthless now that you understand what Christ has done. All right, look at the next verse, verse 8. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. It's all over the New Testament. It's all over the New Testament. So what we've got to do is we've got to examine our lives and say, now, Lord, show me where in my life where I am still striving to try to be right with you and rather than having faith in the righteousness that you have already made available to me. This is big, big stuff. It's, it's, it's probably when you start sweating and striving the most to deserve something from God is when you've absolutely fallen from grace back into the performance of the law trying to get God to do something. And then at this time, most people say, well, yeah, but what do you do? You got to do something. See, now you're fighting against religion. You, you're just so used to doing that, and I don't know why, because you think, well, you know, did something really big happen? If anything happened as a result of that, it's called mercy. 
It's like God knew that one day you were going to get it straightened out and stuff like that, but that's not how you do it, ladies and gentlemen. I have faith in Jesus Christ. I'm the righteousness of God. I have a right to healing. I got a right to deliverance. I got a right to prosperity. I got a right to a good life. I got a right to peace because Jesus is my righteousness. I have faith in him, and now I take a rest. Amen. That's what this is all about. Amen? Amen. Now, let's go to um, John. This is pretty cool. I'm going to look at three scriptures that go with John. John 15, verses uh, 4 through 5 in the NLT. And then I want to go to Isaiah chapter 10 and 15. And then Romans 6 and 13. There's a great message in these three scriptures. John 15, 4 through 5. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch, say out loud, I am a branch. I am a branch. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. Is that true? A branch cannot produce fruit if it's been cut off from the vine or severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And he said he's the vine, right? Next verse. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So here's what he's trying to say. You're trying to be righteous apart from him. You're not going to produce it. You're trying to be redeemed apart from him. Not going to happen. You're trying to prosper apart from him. Not going to happen. He says you can't do anything being severed from me. And so the whole, the whole theme here is in the New Testament, it is not you trying to achieve anything. Jesus has achieved everything for you. Your job is to stay attached to him so you can receive from him. We receive from him righteousness. We receive from him redemption. We receive from him wisdom as long as we stay attached to him and it is our faith in him that's the reason why we've been made the righteousness of God. Now, in light of this, look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 15. This, this might be my favorite scripture after tonight, Isaiah 10, 15. All right, check this out. But can the ax boast greater power than the person who uses it? Is the saw greater than the person who saws? Can a rod strike unless a hand moves it? Can a wooden cane walk by itself? <laughs> okay, so what is he saying? Uh, and I go back to the beginning of this. He is saying whether it's the saw, uh, whether it's the ax, the rod, the what he's saying is those are just all instruments that can't do nothing unless somebody wills it. Even an instrument itself, a musical instrument, a harp is no good unless you have somebody that plays it. A trumpet makes no sound unless somebody supplies the breath. The piano is not playing right now by itself. Now, I know they got them little electrical little things, yeah, little tease things, but you, an ax can't do what it's supposed to do unless somebody powers it. There's got to be a person behind the ax and the saw. You don't see a cane walking by itself. If you do, run. <laughs> but yet, we are the only creation of God that think we can do stuff by ourselves. You can't. You can't. All of creation, everything God created, depends on God. And we who have a free moral agency and a free will somehow have chosen that there are several things we can do without God. That's like the saw saying, you know, I can saw without somebody. Like a cane saying, I can walk without somebody. That's what we've been doing. That's what religion is about. Religion trains you in self-righteousness. 
trying to get you to declare your independence from God. Do it yourself. Now, that goes perfectly with Romans 6, 13. Go to King James on this one, Romans 6, 13. I remember us talking about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Romans 6 and verse 13 in King James, he says this. He says, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. That word yield just simply means allow God to go ahead of you and then you follow. Just like a tra in traffic, you allow a car to go ahead of you and you follow. That's what it means. He says to yield yourself unto God, allow him to go ahead of you and follow as those who are alive from the dead and yield your, your members, you have to yield your members as instruments, as instruments of righteousness unto God, as instruments. We are instruments. So if we are instruments, notice, we are instruments, then we got to make sure we know who's playing us. I want to make sure that God has full authority over this instrument. And that's a journey you have to take because you spent so long yielding this instrument to the wrong spirit. And so you got to ask God, help me to yield my life to you. I'm an instrument. And just like the ax and just like the saw and just like the cane, I can't do nothing by myself. Even Jesus said this. Jesus says, for without him, Jesus said this, I can do nothing. What is it about the human creation that has decided that they can do something without him. I tell you, that started in the Garden of Eden. When Satan told the biggest lie ever, he says, you don't need God, you're just like him. And so when they heard that, they thought, well, well, if, I, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm God, then I don't need, you know, I don't need him. And you know, we gotta straighten that out, you know. Well, the Bible says ye are gods. Well, I know I ain't God. I know where I come from, and I know the identity that I should have, and I know that what comes from him into my life that causes me to be victorious in every area of my life. So, self-righteousness, in, in, in so many words, it is the open door to the works of the flesh. When you operate in the law, that, that's operating in the flesh. I'll show you that a little bit later. But self-righteousness eventually will, will lead you to the works of the flesh. Before the works of the flesh manifest, for example, before adultery, fornication, selfishness, selfish ambition, any of those things show up, guilt causes us to work on ourselves to clean up our own act. And that's what happens. Guilt now, let's, let's put this together and make sure you're catching this. Self-righteousness is the open door to the works of the flesh. Before the works of the flesh manifest, self-righteousness is there. The works of the flesh will manifest. Before the works of the flesh, you can name it, envy, drunkenness. Before the works of the flesh, what's going to happen is if self-righteousness is there, it, stay, it's, it, it, it stays alive because of guilt. Guilt causes us to work on ourselves to clean up our act. Now, I need to stay there a minute because there's a lot of that going on in the body of Christ. I'm guilty, I feel condemned, so I need to work on myself to clean up my act. And I've seen people 20 years go by and they're still working on themselves to clean up their act because they're doing it in self-righteousness and they're doing it motivated by guilt. So whenever we get into self-righteousness in time, sin will be the results, I guarantee you. We sin, then we try to fix it, then we fail again, and then we experience shame, and then we sin again, and then we attempt to fix it, and then we fail, then we experience shame, and on it goes like a vicious cycle with no end. Cycles of sin develop because of that self-condemnation that comes from that self-righteousness. And if we condemn ourselves, we cannot get out of the cycle of sin. And I'm going to tell you why. Because we've identified ourselves by our behavior instead of by our identity in Christ. 
we keep looking at what we do, uh, I'm having bad behavior, therefore I'm a bad person. You follow what I'm saying? And so lots of people have allowed their behavior and what they do define who they are. And you are not and should not be defined by your behavior, all right? You are defined by your faith in Jesus Christ. That's why this is so very important. And then your faith in Jesus Christ, that, that now you are righteous, determines your behavior. Identity first, out of identity becomes behavior. But what happens if you allow your behavior to determine your identity, then it just keeps that cycle of bad behavior because you've allowed behavior to, de to, to define who you are, okay? You miss the mark, that's not who you are. That's not who you are. You miss the mark, that's when you need to stand boldly on saying, I'm the righteousness of God. And you feel dumb and stupid and hypocritical, but it's just to, to remind yourself, though I missed it, that's not who I am. Me missing it is what I did. It's not who I am. Ah. You, you get that? Yes. Praise God. That's, that's so important. Um, so the more people think that God demands righteousness by performance, the more they say, I can't live this Christian life because they think that, you know, they have to perform. But I'm going to tell you something. It, it's not just, uh, you know, too hard. But it, it, in reality, the Christian life is not too hard. It's impossible. <laughs> Why I say that, the only person who who lived up to this standard of God's holiness was Jesus Christ himself. And we have to have him. We have to pay attention to how he did it. And, and he told us, I can't do anything of my own. I got to have you. And that, the lesson, I think, after all these years, I mean, for me, after about 41 years, I think I see the theme of the Bible. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. The theme of the Bible appears to be a declaration of independence from God versus a declaration of dependence to God. And, and I'm, I'm tracing it now. It, it starts off in heaven. What was that whole deal about in heaven? It was Satan convincing a third of the angel, which, by the way, were, were millions, okay? He convinced a third of the angels to declare independence from God. They got kicked out of heaven. Then you go to the Garden of Eden, <laughs> and now Satan is still trying to get people to declare independence from God, and he goes to Adam and Eve with the same deal. And, uh, of course, they did it, declared their independence from God, and their response was eating that fruit. Their action was eating that fruit. And you just go throughout the entire Bible. It's people either going to declare their dependence for God or uh, independence uh, from God. It happened in the book of Exodus again. God never intended for the law to have to come into place. But in Exodus, man, I'll show you this. Moses comes from the mountain, says, here's what God said to do. And they said, we can do it all. Not I need you, but no, we can do it. We don't need God to do it. The next chapter the law was introduced along with the uh, system of sacrificial animals. What was the law to, sent for? To show you you can't do this independent of God. And all that whole time has gone, and now we're in this New Testament, and this whole gospel of grace is about your declaration of depending on who God is. When you start simplifying that, then all of these stories and questions you've ever had about God, the Word, different scriptures, it comes down to that very bottom line. And, and, and even mammon. Mammon is a, it, it's not money. Mammon is a demon spirit that tries to convince you that you should depend on money more than you depend on God. The Bible says uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, what's the love of money? He didn't say money was the root of all evil. He says a wrong relationship with it, the love of money. Well, what's the love of money? To trust money more than you trust God. Mammon is that demon spirit that's trying to motivate people to declare their independence from God 
why they declare their dependence on money. It seems to be that one thread that we have located that seems to be going throughout the entire Word of God, and when applied appropriately, you'll see, whoa, this is what God's trying to get me to do. As a Christian, I am to be the branch that's dependent on the vine. That branch, there's another illustration. That branch that has been broken off the vine, it's proof he withers and dies. But when he's attached to that vine, depending on the vine, you can't get fruit on the vine without depending on the vine. Because the vine is what produces the fruit, not the branch. Do you find yourself striving to perform perfectly for God? Is it a losing battle? In his series, Defining Self-Righteousness, Creflo Dollar uncovers how to be righteous in God's eyes, how to settle the issue of our identity, and how our behavior can line up with our beliefs. Religion is the same thing as self-righteousness. It's man's pursuit to make himself right before God. The Holy Spirit ministers morality by changing your heart, working in you, giving you the desire to do what pleases God and the power to be able to do that. He has accepted the responsibility for our transformation. He didn't ask you to, to work to be right. He asked you to believe Him. Both messages can be yours for a love gift of 15 U.S. dollars for CDs or 25 U.S. dollars for DVDs. Scan the QR code, visit creflodollarministries.org and click eStore, or call the number on your screen to get yours before they run out. Download and stay connected with the Changing Your World podcast with Creflo Dollar. Keep the Word of God at the forefront of your mind with these powerful and uplifting messages. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what the mortgage person says. Have faith in God. If you can see the invisible, He can do the impossible. With each message that you download and stream, you gain revelation of the fullness of God's grace. When you think about what could have happened to me, what should have happened to me, and now look at what's available to me, that's enough for me to tear something up right now all by itself. I got to give him the glory. He saved us. The Changing Your World podcast brings you life-changing wisdom right at your fingertips no matter where you are. Subscribe today on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform. Creflo and Taffy Dollar love connecting with you. And here at World Changers, we understand the importance of using technology to do just that. We're constantly working to bring the gospel of Christ to thousands of viewers and followers around the world. And we want you to get involved. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We want to make the word of grace available throughout every voice of social media. The preceding program was brought to you in part by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries.